Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, June 23rd, 2023. The Supreme Court rules that Texas and Louisiana lack the standing to challenge the Biden administration's immigration regulations that prioritize only certain undocumented illegal immigrants for deportation. We'll talk about the decision in U.S. v. Texas with legal reporter Zach Schoenfeld from The Hill. A half dozen Republican presidential candidates speak at the Faith and Freedom Coalition conference in Washington. One of the main issues, the anniversary of the Supreme Court Dobbs decision, which overturned the Roe v. Wade decision's constitutional right to abortion. And the coalition is advocating for further restrictions on abortion. Dobbs decision anniversary also highlighted today by President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris as they promote reproductive rights, a pillar of their re-election campaign. Attorney General Merrick Garland asked about IRS whistleblowers claiming that Hunter Biden was given preferential treatment by the Biden administration in a tax evasion investigation. Pennsylvania's Governor Josh Shapiro celebrates the early reopening of a collapsed portion of Interstate 95, a major route for shipping goods on the East Coast. U.S. House passes a bill to reverse a change in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac mortgage loan fees that Republicans say penalize borrowers with good credit scores. And the Italian prime minister finishes his state visit to the U.S. with a meeting at the White House with technology company CEOs, both Indian and American. Now to the Supreme Court decision today in U.S. v. Texas, the court siding with the Biden administration in a challenge to immigration regulations that prioritize certain illegal immigrants for deportation. Joining us now on the phone is Zach Schoenfeld, courts and legal reporter with The Hill. Thanks for joining us. What did the Supreme Court decide today? The Supreme Court today ruled that the Biden administration can reinstate those immigration enforcement priorities. Uh, Those priorities had previously been on hold as this case came up through the lower courts. Um, But the Supreme Court today uh, ruling that the Biden administration can reinstate them. Uh, Texas and Louisiana, uh, their Republican attorneys general had been challenging uh, these immigration enforcement priorities. But the Supreme Court today ruling uh, that the states had no legal standing uh, to, to challenge these immigration priorities. So the court's decision today doesn't actually get into the merits of whether uh, the, the Biden administration and, and how they've been uh, doing some of this immigration policy, whether that's lawful or not, but rather finding that Texas and Louisiana did not show enough injury uh, to actually be able to sue in the first place. This was an eight to one decision. Uh, the majority opinion was written by Justice Brett Kavanaugh, one of the court's conservatives. Uh, he was joined by uh, almost all of his colleagues. There was one lone dissenter, Justice Samuel Alito, uh, perhaps one of the the court's leading conservatives, uh, ruling uh, the other way. Um, But the vast majority of the court finding that Texas and Louisiana had no standing to bring this case forward. So in short, this revised those immigration priorities, saying that the Biden administration can once again prioritize uh, certain people who who, pri- uh, who pose certain threats to national security and border security uh, in deportations and arrests. An eight to one ruling. Is that any surprise given the ideological makeup of the justices? Well, standing issues is where you sometimes can see where some of those ideological blocks break up a bit. Uh, All of the justices certainly consider this issue of legal standing to to be quite serious. I know sometimes it gets a little bit into the weeds and and doesn't seem as as super interesting as much as the actual merits of of some of these policies. Um, But the court does take its standing very seriously. Uh, As you can see here uh, today in what was a victory uh, for the Biden administration, a defeat to, to the conservative states of Texas and Louisiana, and leading the way, as we saw, the decision was written by conservative Justice Brett Kavanaugh uh, and joined by many of his fellow other uh, conservatives. Uh, Even Justice Thomas said that the states would not have standing uh, to to bring this lawsuit. So not, you know, the traditional ideological blocks that we see, um, but certainly another sign that that, that the court really does look at these standing issues before actually getting to the merits of these policies, Um, which is certainly an interesting uh, point as we get to the coming decisions over the next week or so. Um, For example, the student debt case that the court has been sitting on. Standing is also a big issue there. Uh, So, you know, we can talk, you you know, all about how the conservatives on this court, um, you know, might be challenging and express doubt in in these various things that the Biden administration is doing. 
But as we're seeing now in these decisions, they really are looking to see before they actually reach the merits, they're, they're taking a good, long, hard look at whether challengers actually have standing. Uh, so certainly as we get closer to the student debt decision in particular, uh, as folks are watching the standing issues there, it uh, will be interesting to see if, if that carries through into next week. We're talking with Zach Schoenfeld with The Hill. There was another immigration-related decision today, this one dealing with free speech. Yeah, this was another immigration case uh, that came down in which it was a challenge to a federal crime that makes it illegal uh, to solicit or facilitate or encourage uh, illegal immigration. Uh, someone who was convicted under that statute uh, had been challenging their conviction. Uh, they said that their First Amendment rights weren't violated. But what they were doing is they were challenging the, the, the crime at issue as being unconstitutionally overbroad, saying that even though their free speech rights might not have been violated, it would violate the free speech rights of other people who could be convicted under this statute. At issue in this case came to, to be exactly how far does this crime, how far is the scope? Um, according to the, the defendants in the case, they were arguing that this crime of encouraging illegal immigration could extend to, you know, anyone who, you know, made any benign statement saying, you know, I, I think people should, you know, c- come and, and uh, come to the U.S. unlawfully. Um, they said that that would end up chilling uh, constitutional speech uh, that was protected under the First Amendment. So they had been challenging this statute overall uh, as being unconstitutionally overbroad. Um, but that, that defendant uh, lost in court in a 7-2 to two decision uh, written uh, by Justice Amy Coney Barrett, one of the court's conservatives. And the court's decision today effectively narrowed the, the scope of the crime, saying that it actually has to require some sort of actual solicitation or facilitation. It doesn't apply to those statements in which someone is you know, just making a benign statement about illegal immigration and actually will require someone to take, take a much more active role in actually soliciting uh, the illegal immigration. Uh, so in short, upholding uh, that federal crime of encouraging illegal immigration, this is another win for the Biden administration. Uh, the Justice Department had appealed this case to the Supreme Court uh, and the Supreme Court today in a 7-2 decision agreeing with the Biden administration and reversing a lower ruling uh, that had invalidated the statute as a violation of the First Amendment. Zach Schoenfeld, the courts and legal reporter with The Hill. Find his stories at thehill.com. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. And on that first Supreme Court immigration decision, U.S. v. Texas, dealing with prioritizing deportation, CBS News writes at the center of the case is a September 2021 directive from the Department of Homeland Security that paused deportations unless individuals had committed acts of terrorism, espionage, or egregious threats to public safety. The guidance issued after Joe Biden became president updated a Trump-era policy to remove people in the country illegally, regardless of criminal history or community ties. That reporting from CBS News and the decision today from the Supreme Court means the new rules from Immigration and Customs Enforcement can be enforced. A story from CNN, President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris are set to join a trio of key reproductive rights activist groups to mark the one-year anniversary of the Dobbs Supreme Court decision Friday, highlighting what's expected to be a major Biden campaign plank for the 2024 presidential election. The Biden administration and campaign have been making an all-hands-on-deck push for reproductive rights, messaging this week ahead of Saturday's anniversary of the ruling that overturned the landmark Roe v. Wade decision harnessing the moment on an issue that animated voters in 2022, and they believe will do so again in 2024. That from CNN. The president and vice president posting a video ahead of the campaign rally with the Democratic National Committee. With the Dobbs decision, a 50-year constitutional right, it was totally erased by the Supreme Court when it overturned Roe v. Wade. With one decision, millions of women lost the fundamental freedom to make decisions about their own health and their future. Our commitment to you then was that we never stop fighting for your reproductive rights. And since then, we have taken action to protect safe, FDA-approved medication abortion. We have worked to make sure patients who have miscarriages receive the medical care they need. And we have strengthened privacy protections for patients and health care providers. This week, I'm proud to sign the third reproductive health care executive order. 
which strengthens access to affordable, high-quality contraception. This executive order directs private health plans, Medicaid, Medicare, and federally funded health care centers to make it easier for Americans across the country to obtain the birth control they need. We're also expanding family planning services and supplies across the Medicaid program. We're ensuring robust coverage of contraception for service members, veterans, and federal employees. And we're considering ways to improve access to affordable, over-the-counter contraception. Because access to contraception means that women can make decisions about their own health, their lives, and their families. Contraception is an essential part of reproductive health care. And more important than ever, as a woman's health is under attack across the country, it's needed. Together, we will continue to fight to protect Americans' reproductive freedom. Vice President Kamala Harris and President Joe Biden, a video put out today ahead of tomorrow's one-year anniversary of the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision that reversed the Roe v. Wade decision from 1973 that had guaranteed the right to abortion. And today, three pro-choice groups endorsed the Biden-Harris re-election ticket, Emily's List, NARAL Pro-Choice America, and Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Story from Associated Press, one year After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, some of the Republican Party's most influential evangelical Christian figures assembled Friday to celebrate a ruling that sent shockwaves through American politics and stripped away a longstanding constitutional protection. At the Faith and Freedom Coalition's annual conference, Republican presidential candidates were urged to push for more abortion restrictions, even as Democrats insist the issue will buoy them going into the 2024 election. That from Associated Press. C-SPAN covered today's Faith and Freedom Coalition conference in Washington. Here are a few of those Republican presidential candidates, starting with former Vice President Mike Pence. We must support efforts in state houses across the country to protect the unborn and support women facing crisis pregnancies with new and renewed resources. And literally with nearly every nation in Europe, limiting abortion to 12 to 15 weeks. The fact is today, abortion law in the United States is more aligned with China and North Korea than with Western nations in Europe. So I want to say from my heart, every Republican candidate for president should support a ban on abortion before 15 weeks as a minimum nationwide standard. You'll hear more about that in the days ahead, I expect. It's, but a 15-week ban on abortions at the national level would create a minimum standard that would align us with much of the West, and then the work will continue. You know, I've long believed that a society can be judged by how it deals with its most vulnerable, the aged, the infirm, the disabled, and the unborn. Now, we can never bring back those 62 million American lives lost to the tragedy of but we can fight for the next generation. And with compassion and principle and leadership, we can seize this moment in history. So I want to say to all of you from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you for all you've done in the conservative movement. Thank you for the privilege of serving as your vice president. It was the greatest honor of my life. You know, I'll always be grateful for what President Donald Trump did for this country. And it was a privilege to serve at his side. The President and I have had our differences, and we have them still, but elections are about the future. And I believe different times call for different leadership. Republican presidential candidate Mike Pence, former vice president at the Faith and Freedom Coalition Conference in Washington, D.C. Former President Donald Trump, who's also a candidate for president in 2024, will be giving the keynote address at this conference on Saturday night. On abortion and the anniversary of the Dobbs decision, a new NBC poll finds that 61 percent of Americans disapprove of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Broken down by party, 65 percent of Republicans say they approve of the decision. Ninety-two percent of Democrats say they disapprove of that ruling. Here's more from today's Faith and Freedom Coalition conference. Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida. We see the problems in this country. You see the economy where you pay more for daily necessities like groceries 
Meanwhile, the people in this town, with all the spending, the debt, and the printing that's been done, you know, they're living high on the hog. You see a southern border that's wide open. You see illegal aliens pouring in and massive amounts of deadly narcotics coming in. You see cities that have been overrun with crime, places that have been hollowed out like San Francisco. And we see a federal government whose agencies have been weaponized against their fellow Americans, including people of faith. And underlying all that is the fact that the left is lighting the fire of a cultural revolution all across this land. The fire smolders in our schools, it smolders in corporate boardrooms, it smolders in the halls of government. We are told that we must accept that men can get pregnant. We, we are told to celebrate a swimmer who swam for three years on the men's team and then switches to the women's team and somehow is named the women's champion. We are told to sit idly by as they try to rewrite and distort our history and demean the founders of this nation. We have had to watch as a football coach had to go all the way to the US Supreme Court just to get his job back for the quote crime of saying prayers at, at the midfield after football games. And of course, we see professional sports teams uh, openly elevating groups who overtly demean people of faith. Let's just be very clear about this. We did not start this fire. But as president, but as president of the United States, I will lead the effort to extinguish the fire of cultural Marxism once and for all, all across this country. We will restore sanity to this nation. We will return normalcy to our communities, and we will reinstate integrity across institutions. This is a time for clarity. This is a time to stand for truth. This is a time to proudly put on the full armor of God. Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, in Washington at the Faith and Freedom Coalition Road to the Majority Conference. More from the Associated Press article on the conference and the governor's speech. They write, the governor DeSantis championed having recently signed a state ban of abortion after six weeks of pregnancy in Florida, though he has been less clear about where he stands on a federal ban. He told the crowd that the state limit was the right thing to do don't let anyone tell you it wasn't. Associated Press writes that appears to be an allusion to Donald Trump, who has cautioned against going that far. Senator Tim Scott, Republican from South Carolina, also a presidential candidate, also speaking at today's conference about his faith and abortion. I once heard that the era of value voters was over, someone wrote recently. I'm so excited that they were dead wrong. I'm looking around here and I see people just like me who have faith on their sleeves, Jesus in their hearts, and we're just getting started. I'll say this, the truth of my life disproves the lies of the radical left. They want to divide our country according to race and create tribes, but I'm here to say, not on my watch. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll say this, there's no question. When you think about the radical left and their agenda, we have to start with tomorrow's anniversary and thank God Almighty for the Dobbs decision. Yeah. Absolutely. We are creating a culture of life in America, and that's a really good thing. But I will say, without any question, the Secretary of the Treasury was in the middle of a banking hearing, and I'm on the banking committee, and I heard the Secretary of the Treasury, the second most powerful woman in the Biden administration, say that poor black women should have abortions to improve their labor force 
participation rate. I said to myself, I could not have heard that right. I know y'all don't know this, but I'm black. <laughs> and so I said to myself, my mother, a single parent, mired in poverty, made the decision for life. And I thank God Almighty that she chose to bring me in the world. So I ran down to my banking hearing to ask Secretary Yellen myself, just to see if I heard her right. And she said, she doubled down on it. She said, absolutely, in order to increase black employment and black opportunity, abortion is an alternative. What a desperate position to take. The radical left has lost so much faith in America, they've lost faith in life itself, but we are here to tell them life is good, and we are proud to be Americans. We are proud to live in the freest, fairest land on God's green earth. Senator Tim Scott, Republican from South Carolina and presidential candidate today at the Faith and Freedom Coalition Conference in Washington, D.C. The coalition was founded in 2009 by the founder of the Christian Coalition, Ralph Reed, who described it as a 21st century version of the Christian Coalition. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Republican presidential candidate, was booed today by some in the crowd at this conference after he spoke critically of fellow Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. Beware, everybody, of a leader who never makes mistakes. Beware of a leader who has no faults. Beware of a leader who says that when something goes wrong, it's everybody else's fault. And he goes and he blames those people for anything that goes wrong, but when things go right, everything is to his credit. Now, there are, there are a lot of people, a lot of people who wonder after I was the first candidate to endorse Donald Trump in 2016, the very first. After, after he made me chairman of his transition, after he made me chairman of his opioid and drug abuse commission, after, and this one will keep you up at night, everybody, after I played Hillary Clinton in debate prep, you won't be able to sleep thinking about that one tonight. And after I played Joe Biden in debate prep in 2020, why am I running for president of the United States? I'm running because he's let us down. He has let us down because he's unwilling. He's unwilling to take responsibility for any of the mistakes that were made, any, uh, any of the faults that he has, and any of the things that he's done. And that is not leadership, everybody. That is a failure of leadership. And I, you can boo all you want, but here's the thing. Our faith teaches us that people have to take responsibility for what they do. People have to stand up and take accountability for what they do. And I, I cannot stand by, and as soon as I've started to be critical, after all of that, and after you offered me White House Chief of Staff, now what he does is call me names and belittle me. And I will tell you, if all you do, if all you do is disagree with someone, and in return you get that kind of treatment, I've joined a great list of Americans like Rex Tillerson and Jim Mattis and Mark Esper and Mick Mulvaney and John Kelly and all the rest, and you can love him all you want, but I will tell you, I will tell you that doing those kind of things makes our country smaller. It makes our country smaller, and it makes us lesser. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Republican presidential candidate at the Faith and Freedom Coalition Conference, several other Republican presidential candidates speaking today including Vivek Ramaswamy, Asa Hutchinson, and Francis Suarez, and more will be speaking at Saturday's session, including Nikki Haley, Will Hurd, and Donald Trump. 
C-SPAN is covering it all. You can find the full video at cspan.org. This is Washington Today. From ABC News, Attorney General Merrick Garland on Friday gave his most detailed and direct defense yet to allegations raised by IRS agents of potential wrongdoing and political influence in the Justice Department's probe of Hunter Biden. For the first time, Merrick Garland disputed outright one of the main allegations leveled by the purported whistleblowers that Trump appointed U.S. Attorney David Weiss had requested to be named a special counsel and was turned down by Merrick Garland. The ABC News article also notes congressional Republicans on Thursday released transcripts of their interviews with the two IRS whistleblowers who in April accused the Justice Department of granting Hunter Biden preferential treatment during its year-long probe of his tax affairs. Here are the reporters' questions to the Attorney General today at a Justice Department news conference. Yesterday, whistleblower testimony came out from an IRS supervisory special agent, current supervisory special agent, who insists he was in a meeting with U.S. Attorney David Weiss, who in October 2022 claimed in front of multiple people that he was told not to pursue the Hunter Biden investigation, not to bring charges in 2022. You said previously you've stayed out of the Hunter Biden investigation. It's been on David Weiss to figure that out. Can you once and for all shed a little light? There seems to be a little confusion on what's going on here. Uh, I'd be happy to. As I said at the outset, uh, Mr. Weiss, who was appointed by President Trump as the U.S. Attorney in Delaware and assigned this matter during the previous administration, would be permitted to continue his investigation and to make a decision to prosecute any way in which he wanted to and in any district in which he wanted to. Mr. Weiss has since sent a letter to the House Judiciary Committee confirming that he had that authority. I don't know how it would be possible for anybody to block him from bringing a prosecution, given that he has this authority. And he was never told no? I would say he was given complete authority to make all decisions on his own. Um, Mr. Garland, just to follow up on that, um, one of the uh, allegations that one of the IRS supervisors apparently made uh, was uh, involved the fact that Mr. Weiss reportedly wanted to uh, uh, have the powers you conferred on special counsels. Was that request ever made? And if so, uh, did you, why did you reject it? It was not. The only person with authority to make somebody a special counsel or refuse to make somebody a special counsel was the Attorney General. Mr. Weiss never made that request to me. Well, on that, do you think that uh, a special counsel, can you explain the rationale for not appointing a special counsel in this case? Mr. Weiss had, in fact, more authority than a special counsel would have. He has complete, he, has, he had and has complete authority, as I said, to bring a case anywhere he wants in his discretion. Attorney General Merrick Garland at the Justice Department with reporters. The Twitter account RNC Research, RNC for Republican National Committee, includes a video of Hunter Biden at Thursday night's state dinner at the White House for the Prime Minister of India. And the account has this description. Here is deadbeat Hunter Biden embroiled in a massive family-wide corruption scandal rubbing elbows at last night's White House state dinner. And Congressman Rudy Vacum, Republican from Indiana, quote tweeting it, adding, In the swamp, it's good to be a Biden. The White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, getting questions today from reporters about this. The president invited his son Hunter to the state dinner last night. Um, I'm wondering if you could take us into the thinking and decision-making of why uh, the president decided to invite I, him. I'm just not going to get into family discussion, personal family discussion. As you know, Hunter is his son. I'm just not going to get well, into let me it. Ask you this. If, if Hunter Biden wasn't the president's son, would he have invited someone who had just reached a plea agreement with federal prosecutors? Well, a, co- a couple of things. Again, that's his son. It's a, he's a family member. It is not uncommon for family members to attend uh, events at the White House. You could look at past presidents. I'm sure you have. So that is not uncommon. A- as it relates to anything uh, uh, related to, uh, to Hunter, I'm just not going to respond to it from here. Can I follow up on okay. that? No, I just called in somebody. Go ahead. Yeah. So, but I mean, so Kirby wouldn't answer James's question, though. Are you going to answer the question? I mean, not, not a reasonable question to ask no, with the President I, of the United States who's involved, as this message seems to suggest, 
in some sort of a coercive conversation for business dealings by a son, is that something, <coughs> if he wasn't, then maybe you should tell us. So that. here's the thing, I, and I appreciate the question. I believe my colleague uh, at the White House Council uh, has answered this question already, has dealt with this, has uh, uh, made it very clear. I just don't have anything to share outside of my, what my colleagues have shared, uh, and so I would refer you to him and the, D and the DOJ. Just not going to comment from here. Text I will, all, what I can tell you is I know that my colleague has dealt with this. He, he uh, addressed this the, at the White House Council. I just don't have anything well, else to share. Just, I, just, I, just answered answered no. I just answered just the question. I just answered the question. Yes or no, was the president involved in the shakedown attack? Yes no, yes no, yes no, yes no, I just answered, Stephen, yes no, Stephen, I just answered the question. I just no. said, I just, this is, it's not up to you how I answer the question. I just answer the question by telling you my colleagues at the White House Council has dealt with this, and I would refer you to them. Go ahead. Can you just remind us what your colleague said from the White House Council so we have it? I would, I, would, I would refer you to them and they will share their statement with all of you. Is there your anything? statements from that podium. You've stated that the President stands by his comment from the 2020 campaign that he never once discussed his son's overseas business dealings with his son. And you stood at that podium yeah. and you reaffirmed that. Do you stand by your reaffirmation? I, what I will say is nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And I will leave it there. Anything else, I will refer you to the White House Counsel. This is not a change? I just answered the question. You, asked, you just asked me, do, does my statement change? I just told you nothing has changed. That's answering the question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. The White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, with reporters today in the White House briefing room. Hunter Biden is scheduled to appear before a U.S. District Judge in Delaware on July 26 for a plea hearing related to his plea agreement concerning a tax evasion case and illegal gun possession. Washington Today continues in a moment. When citizens are truly informed, our republic thrives. Get informed straight from the source on C-SPAN. Unfiltered, unbiased, word for word. From the nation's capital to wherever you are. Because the opinion that matters the most is your own. This is what democracy looks like. C-SPAN, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. Traffic is moving on temporary lanes again on a portion of Interstate 95 in Philadelphia that collapsed 12 days ago following a deadly tanker truck crash and fire under the overpass. WPIV-TV reporting the lanes were built much faster than officials originally predicted. In the days after the collapse, officials believe the construction would take months. The, dis the closure of an important commercial artery snarled traffic in and around Philadelphia and threatened to raise the cost of consumer goods as truckers were forced to detour around the area. State and federal officials pledged quick action to minimize the economic impact and inconvenience. The governor of Pennsylvania, Democrat Josh Shapiro, spoke at the reopening on site. And one of the most exceptional things that I've seen over these last 12 days is that everyone wanted to help. Everyone wanted to be a part of this from SEPTA stepping up to add capacity and welcome new riders, to Pocono Raceway lending us their jet dryers to ensure the road stayed dry so it could be paved and striped. Bet y'all didn't know I was a NASCAR guy. <laughs> to Philly Staples like Wawa and Star Restaurants delivering shorties and burritos for the work crews at the shift change. To the thousands of folks who turned on the live stream to check in on our progress and cheer on those who are doing the work. This was a moment of civic pride for Philly and Pennsylvania. We all came together and we proved that we could do big things again in Pennsylvania. We all came together and we showed that when times get hard, Pennsylvanians show up for one another. And we showed that when we work together, we can get it done here in Pennsylvania. We sure can. <laughs> Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, Democrat at a news conference at the site of the reopened I-95 portion that had collapsed. And yes, in the original, he, the governor did say the profanity. White House says that President Biden called Governor Shapiro today and President Biden visited the site last week. And according to the White House, told his administration to move heaven and earth to reopen I-95 as soon as possible. C-SPAN's Capitol Hill producer Craig Kaplan tweeting, 
House passed legislation to reverse changes made by Federal Housing Finance Agency to the pricing for home loans that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac buy. Vote was 230 to 189. 14 Democrats joined all Republicans in voting yes. The bill now heads to the Senate. The White House opposes it. Here's some of the House floor debate before that vote. Congresswoman Stephanie Bice, Democrat from Oklahoma, in support. Under the rule from the Federal Housing Finance Agency, home buyers with good credit scores will be forced to pay more for their mortgages to subsidize loans to higher risk borrowers. And that is why the Middle Class Borrower Protection Act is so important. It will roll back this administration's senseless rule and stop the anti-capitalist agenda. Similar to the student loan scam, the president is once again trying to bypass Congress and centralize more power in the hands of the executive branch. Since President Biden took office, he has increased the role of the federal government in the lives of everyday Americans, and this is a perfect example. With sky-high mortgage rates, the last thing we need is to add more fees and burdens on hardworking Americans and certainly hardworking Oklahomans in my district. I stand in support of this legislation, and I urge my colleagues to support the bill. Congresswoman Stephanie Bice, Republican from Oklahoma, on the House floor. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Democrat from California, spoke in opposition. During the Rules Committee debate, Republicans called FHFA's changes redistributive. Let's be clear, FHFA made changes to ensure that middle-class home buyers are not unfairly charged more for risk than are already covered by private mortgage insurance. This is hardly redistribution. It's ensuring that middle class bars have a fair shot at home ownership. Mr. Davidson's bill, on the other hand, would absolutely redistribute costs from the middle class to the wealthy. Let me break this down for the record. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office determined that this bill would cost $1.8 billion before the addition of the manager's amendment. That represents $1.8 billion in fees that otherwise would have primarily affected the wealthiest home buyers who could barely notice such a nominal fee increase in order to pay for this cost. Republicans added a 10 basis point guarantee fee that would increase cost for all home buyers to the tune of $5 billion. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Democrat from California, the ranking member on the Financial Services Committee on the House floor before the House voted to pass this bill. Again, it was 230 to 189. 14 Democrats joining the Republicans and voting yes. The bill now heads to the Senate, but the White House says it is opposed. Wall Street today, the Dow down 219, NASDAQ down 138, S&P down 33. The Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, finishing up his state visit to the United States with a luncheon at the State Department attended by Vice President Kamala Harris and Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and a roundtable at the White House with President Biden and CEOs from U.S. and Indian technology companies. On the U.S. side, Microsoft, Google, OpenAI among them. A Reuters article reads that the meeting included pledges of deeper U.S.-India cooperation on areas including space, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. Here is Prime Minister Modi. The sectors represented here that touch our lives in every way, and uh, technology uh, is uh, something that touches our lives, and all technology sectors are represented here. And uh, there are well-established firms here and startups here as well. And both of them uh, can uh, work to, are working together to create a new world. And I'm very pleased that under the leadership of President Biden, technology, uh, understanding the importance of uh, technology, the progress that America has made in the area of technology, and uh, the youth in India, thanks to its talent, has created an identity for itself in the world. 
So this uh, coming together of uh, talent and technology, I believe this uh, is definitely a guarantee for a bright future. This morning, the discussion we've had with just a few friends, but uh, this morning is uh, with us, giving us a guarantee for a bright future. And this is a very uh, small group of people, but this is a very promising group, a wonderful group, and uh, one which is going to give a direction to the world, which is going to uh, build uh, the future of the world. Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi at the White House, a roundtable with President Biden and the CEOs of technology companies, both American and Indian. President Biden giving the prime minister a T-shirt with one of the prime minister's quotes on it, a little play on artificial intelligence. It reads, the future is AI, and then in parentheses, America and India. On the war in Ukraine, Associated Press reporting that authorities in Russia launched a criminal probe Friday against the owner of the Wagner Group military contractor over his alleged threats to oust Russia's defense minister. The announcement follows a statement from the owner accusing the Russian defense minister of ordering a rocket strike on Wagner's field camps in the Ukraine, where its soldiers are fighting on behalf of Russia against Ukrainian forces. At the White House, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby asked about what's happening in Ukraine and their counteroffensive against Russia's military positions in eastern Ukraine. President Zelensky said this week that the pace of the counteroffensive is moving slower than desired. Is the administration concerned right now about the pace and what you guys are seeing and hearing from talking with Ukrainian officials? We're focused on making sure that the Ukrainian armed forces have everything that they need to be successful. Um, war is unpredictable, and the enemy gets a vote. And uh, I'm certainly not going to get up here and speak to Ukrainian offensive operations. They, they should be the ones to do that. Uh, but I don't think that, that they went into this with some sort of uh, false sense of, 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 of confidence uh, uh, about, about how tough it was going to be. It's not as if the Russians, and we talked about this many times from here, that the Russians were preparing for this, throwing bodies at, at, the, at the problem set, putting in additional forces, building defense lines, sometimes three lines deep. Um, it's not as if the Russians weren't preparing for defense, and defense uh, is a strong form of war. Uh, and, you know, the, the Ukrainians are, are, are fighting through this. Um, uh, I think uh, we just all have to recognize that the combat can be unpredictable. And sometimes uh, your, your plans don't always go exactly the way that you, uh, you expected them to, but, but that's what's expected when you're, when you're in combat. What we're going to focus on, again, is making sure that they can be ultimately successful. John Kirby, Strategic Communications Coordinator for the National Security Council in the White House Briefing Room. An article from the Washington Examiner has the United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, urged the U.N. to conduct an investigation into the drones Iran has supplied to Russia for use in Ukraine. Iran has provided hundreds of unmanned aerial vehicles that Russia has used for months to target Ukraine's critical infrastructure. The U.S. believes there's a chance the facility Russia is building to manufacture more of them could be operational by early next year. That from Washington Examiner. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. You can sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word to get the stories Washington is talking about emailed to you every day. Subscribe at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night and weekend.